The next session and the last session of today is going to be chaired by Carolina. So Carolina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, yes, it's my pleasure to present the third speaker of the day, Giovanni De Gregorio, um, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center of so for Social Legal Studies at the University of Oxford, and his research focuses on digital constitutionalized constitutionalism, sorry, <laughs> platform governance and digital policy. And his presentation today is on the lawlessness of moderating online hate speech. Um, I'm very much looking forward to it and to the discussion afterwards. So Giovanni, over to you. Yeah, thanks Carolina. So thank you so much also for the presentation. Sorry, because I was a little bit late this morning, but I had, you know, it just went back to the UK and then we had some overlapping this morning, but uh, I'm very happy to be here with all of you. And also because I think that uh, this is a, an amazing opportunity to discuss um, uh, the, the problem of hate speech and, this, and also, as you have seen, uh, the draft that I shared with you was a broader framework that, of course, could be applied to hate speech for sure, as the first example shown, as we will discuss also in this presentation. But still, I think that it's just, uh, it's important to say that, of course, this concern hate speech, but it could be applied to different problems concerning the moderation of uh, online content, you know. Of course, also, as you will see, hate speech, I would say that it's almost a very interesting case study uh, to study why, in a way, the entire process of moderation of this content and expression is, in a way, governed by multiple ways of rules that, at the very end, leads to the opposite way. Rather to have an over-governance, probably we have a kind of lawlessness, because actually there is no rule really governing the flow of online hate speech or the online content. So I think that the case of hate speech is quite interesting, and this is just let me introduce this point and I, pro I promise I'll try to talk even for less than 20 minutes or 25 minutes, I promise that. And um, this is part of a broader research, you know, we are conducting also in Oxford is about um, online media, hate and speech, especially in peripheral areas of the world, like Africa or other places. And so we are trying to understand what happened, especially in this place, for the spread of online hate speech and the moderation of this content. So this, as you can imagine, this also concerns the use of AI to moderate online hate. What are the main issues? The issues of how governments react to the spread of online hate speech is another important point and piece of the puzzle, especially in those countries that massively have relied on internet shutdowns to deal with the spread of hate speech in some countries. You know, so and to be honest, part of my research. I was also focused uh, on the cooperation between public and private actors in addressing the issues of illicit content. And I'm pretty sure that also the, the Israeli case has a lot to say about, you know, also the Supreme Court has intervened in order to uh, define uh, what are the boundaries in the cooperation between public and private actors, for example, in taking some form of online content. So it is quite interesting also, also to stress. But generally speaking, let's say that um, the idea of this research is what we like to do is to study also the connection that there is between online content and hate speech online and the, also the effects that this content produces because this is very hard. You know, there are no measures, there are no really criteria to measure the consequences of online hate speech. Of course, we know, for example, and this is why we're going to these slides, you know, we know what happened, for example, on the, on the left side of this slide, on the right side of this slide. So the attack at Capitol Hill, and the and you know the genocide you know in in Myanmar. So in both cases we have, we have an idea you know about how hate speech has inflamed people, has contributed to moving people to you know to pushing people to do something you know. But what is there you know the reason is there really a connection between what happens in you know, online and offline? Probably the answer is yes. But how to measure that is another story. So we are trying to understand more the politics of online hate speech and disinformation, also looking at this, there are, of course, case studies or example, also interviewing people that are involved in plugging content. And so all this research is quite connected, but it's very hard, to be honest, you know, to understand the consequences of online hate speech for society, because it's not easy to measure the connection between what is happening online and what actually happens, you know, on a public square or whatever, you know? And just to step back a little bit, you know, I'm pretty sure that all of you know is pretty much the issues of contemplation, you know, but what is it, this is particularly important to introduce the issue of contemplation when we want to understand how hate speech or line hate speech is governed 
or the oil speeches go by law one, you know? And of course, it's important to understand that the, the governance of, and, uh, or in general, the governance of expression of content is based, of course, in the, the process of content moderation that we can say we, we can distinguish at least these three layers. These quite, they are quite prevalent. I mean, there are also other angles. This is just an example. Uh, the first one is, of course, between soft moderation and admiration, because the problem with online hate speech does not just concern the removal of hate speech or tackling hate speech, just deleting that online from, from the online spaces, but also the soft moderation. So actually the deprioritization, the shadow ban of online hate speech so or the prey filtering so these are all activities that are just not just concern the removal of content the censorship of content but still are relevant when we address hate speech online then of course it's important to distinguish between the community and commercial moderation because of course it is different when there is a social media moderating content you know for profit and so you know there have been even a, a big huge bottom-up campaign against the, the hate for profit as you know very well Another thing is that when we have the platforms that actually do not really profit from content, but actually host, you know, a comment section or actually think about platforms that do not actually moderate content for profit. There is another story, but still is relevant for hate speech in a way, but in a different way, as you can imagine. And this also leads us to think about the incentives and the models to address this issue, to regulate these platforms or, or problems. But and then there are another big issue in the field. It's about the distinction between human and automated moderation. There is a reason why. Because actually, uh, content moderation is not just uh, automated per se. You know, I mean, usually is automated, but it depends where. The language it depends on a lot of things, depends on the areas of the world that we, know we are. And also, of course, it's a mix between algorithmic system or AI system that are able just to detect and classify whether something's a speech or not, for example. And this, you will understand why we're talking about the lawlessness when uh, we deal with the distinction between human and automated moderation. But having said that, again, on this is important to understand also, to, to understand, the, the, again, the governance of online hate speech, what is the logic of moderation? Because basically, you know, social media, but all the platforms which, whose business model basically, you know, is around, uh, you know, advertising and, of course, uh, profiting from, you know, online user attention in a way, of course, they try to, they have a kind of paradoxical incentive, you know, on the one hand, they try to ensure a safe environment where users can just feel free to share content and is on the one hand, because the more users you have, the more content you have, and so the more advertising revenues you have. So this equation leads us also to think another point that is quite the opposite. And also the process of moderation is not driven by, of course, public interest, but to private business purposes. And so what is the paradox in content moderation? Now, on the one hand, platforms want to take a late speech because they want to ensure a peaceful environment. But on the other hand, they know that some content creates more engagement and more engagement means more profits. And so this leads even to the prioritization of some content. There is not by chance that some parts of research has shown also that usually sentiments like hate or even happiness or something like that, like in also the case of disinformation, leads to increased engagement. And so, of course, this feeds actually the platform business model. And so the problem here is the translation, of course, of uh, quasi-legal standards, as you can imagine, in the algorithmic logic. So how we can ensure that this process is pretty much automated actually reflects what we imagine when we want to take late speech, for example, in this case. So. And basically, here we are going towards the, the center and the focus of this presentation is about the lawlessness of content moderation. Because, I mean, at the very end, there are at, le at the very least three layers, you know, of governance. The first one is the law. You know, as you can imagine, that state actors usually regulate what is hate speech or, you know, this is basically the rule of law. So providing a definition of hate speech, and that is usually it's a crime, you know, basically it's regulated by criminal law. And, they, and that's it. Okay, and that's one point. But at the same time, we've seen also with the with the rise of social media, the emergence, of course, of private standards. You know, define term, think about terms of service. It's actually define what is hate speech usually. You know, you cannot actually share this content because it's not allowed according to our community guidelines. Fine. But also we have internal guidelines. So guidelines that are not shared with users, but still define how content are moderated. So we have even a form of regulation that is defined as a rule of the platform because actually it's not always aligned with uh, what is hate speech according to the law or international law, national law. 
And this can be seen also in the, in a way, in the way which platforms sometimes uh, comply with state obligation, with state order to remove content. Sometimes they actually resist that, you know. And this is a kind of competition of definition and models between uh, the rule of law and the rule of platforms. But there is even another layer. There's about, you know, it's kind of rhetoric in a way to say, but it's a way the idea of the rule of tech, because even platforms, you know, sometimes cannot actually explain how, for example, an online hate speech is moderated, because of course the problem of AI, and I don't want to take time to talk about that, because we have also the q and I mean, the, the discussion later, because it's not a proper q and I mean, it's a discussion, it's a workshop. So, um, so this creates another layer of governance where machines, you know, decide, you know, when classifying something, whether it's hate speech or not, of course, they take a decision. And this decision is not always dependent on the rule of platforms, but it's dependent on the rule that is actually unaccountable, both to states and platforms. And so this is why we can imagine another layer of governance as the rule of tech. And so these three layers of governance leads us to think about whether really the governance of hate speech is actually over-regulated or it's probably in a situation of lawlessness because no one can really understand what's happening in the moderation of online hate speech. And let's use, for example, what different actors are doing to deal and understand. So let's try to understand this competition of models. And I want to use, you know, this is a kind of, um, you know, landmark case, you know, landmark example, you know, there's a kind of, the kind of Facebook oversight board. And the Facebook oversight board, in a way, can, uh, it's also an answer, you know, to deal with the problem sometimes of moderating AI, moderating content with AI. So we need someone, you know, we need the rule of the platforms in a way to be able to be scrutinized, to understand what is the rule that has been applied to a certain case. It's interesting because the Facebook oversight board has been an example. I mean, has not been, let's say, so useful in terms of adjudicating cases because there are too, too little, you know, if you think about an entire year, but it's been very useful to think about in a way how to, in a way, shape the rule of the platforms. How Facebook should Facebook is not just about Facebook, but in the case in this case, yes, it's about how Facebook should revise, for example, its community guidelines or terms of services. What are the action that the platform should take in order to improve certain content moderation processes? So this is the real goal. In a way, the Facebook Oversight Board is a good example how we try the platform. They are trying to ensure that sometimes the rule of tech does not, you know, take the lead also on the rule of platforms in a way. And then of course, there is also the level of the rule of law is not by chance that in this competition of models, uh, you know, the Facebook oversight board has been even compared to a, to a private Supreme Court, but there's another story. And what is doing, for example, the union, if you think about, you know, let's go back to the rule of law in a way. And I mean, no one is really defining what is hate speech. I mean, the European Union has even a, um, a directive framework to define what is hate speech, you know. So we have a definition of hate speech, but in terms of platforms, in terms to, con in a way, tackle the rise and consolidation of the rule of platforms, I mean, the EU is not really doing, you know, it's one of the, sorry, it's pretty much the opposite. <laughs> the, the union is really, you know, struggling with the finding a model to address this issue. And so the, the question here, of course, the, the European Union is taking a certain path to address the rule of the platforms. And it's quite important because all the new measures that will be probably even introduced by the DSA are, just, are nothing else than the result in order to underline the relevance of the rule of law over, in a way, the rule of the platforms or even the rule of tech. It's not by chance that the AI Act, for example, in the EU or the Digital Service Act are precisely, they try to reduce the relevance and the consolidation of narratives or powers that comes from the private sector, but not just the private sector, but technology and platforms. So it's not just by, by chance, but it's important to understand that this, this issue is not just a general rule all over the world, because when we move on the other side of the Atlantic, when we move to the US, this is not just, this is not the case. Because the problem of moderating online hate speech, no matter what happened at Capitol Hill, is still a problem of freedom. So, I mean, and we know, even if I do not mention, you know, the case of the U.S. Supreme Court, I mean, we do not need any other, you know, addition to, to think about that the U.S. framework and also the idea of the First Amendment see platform as an engine for democracy rather than a threat. And this, of course, has led to a kind of uh, uh, 
we can say stable approach in the last 20 years by the US in a way that not that actually there is no need actually to regulate social media because actually how we can regulate social media if they are an engine of democracy so they provide positive and this is why we are can going back with that actually the positive you know you know effects of content moderation if, if you compare that with the negative effects, for example, of hate speech online. So still, in a way, the constitutional balance in the US is still positive, while in the EU, in a way, it's negative if you think about that. And this is why this has also led to different regulatory reactions across the Atlantic. But this is not the end of the story, because when we try to look a little bit farther or out from the, you know, the Western debate around content moderation, we can see how even other states have reacted to the spread of online hate speech. And this raised question about how to address this issue. Think about, for example, that some countries, for example, have regulated that speech, for example, and uh, sometimes I've also followed, for example, the part of Germany, in some cases like Kenya, if I'm not wrong, that tried to implement the net stage, the, the net stage or the net stage to, you know, move the standard of safeguards or uh, take a late speech online according to that model. But African countries, you know, but there's another example, they've also reacted to the spread of online hate speech, just shutting down the internet. And this is quite interesting because sh the internet shutdown has also become a, a form of retaliation, you know, because of course, social media sometimes have, you know, put under the pressure of say that if you do not remove some content, you know, and sometimes it's concerned even political speech, of course, I will shut down the internet, I will block your service. And so this, this form, of course, is another example of how the rule of law, even if it is not really the notion of rule of law, as you can imagine, you know, try to influence the rule of platforms in a way or the rule of tech. Indeed, it's quite interesting also that states usually, especially in, in different examples of internet shutdowns, use the problem of national security of the spread of online aid or violence or violence in the streets in order to shut down the internet. So there is a big connection between the spread of online aid and also the internet shutdowns. But how we should, how we measure, you know, the connection between the spread of online aid speech and internet shutdowns, this is something that we really need to work more on it, and not just we actually different scholars. And so this is just because I would like just to think with you, just for even discussion with you uh, about uh, this problem of the lawlessness of content moderation. Probably some interesting points could also come from mapping, in a way, again, the offline consequences of aid and violence online. And this is like still an open topic. But of course, uh, there are also side effects of online aid speech. When we do not look, for example, at the US or the EU, you know, there are the two, in a way, if you can use this expression, the two democratic models in a way that are trying to address the issue of platforms, but in a way, we have, they are very opposite in a way to think about. On the one end, we have a regulatory phase, on the other end, we have actually I cannot say nothing, but you know, nothing has changed in the last 20 years. So, of course, there have been a lot of debates in the US about how we can address this problem, especially even in the aftermath of capital real. But still, you know, the situation is, is pretty much the same. And even if there is a huge debate, nothing is really changing, also because the US Supreme Court is quite straight in this on this topic, by the way. Um, and the other important point is that this case study, if you want to take it as a case study show us a kind of interconnection between the responsibility of states and platforms. So this is, this is even relevant for the framework of business and human rights, if you think about that, in the regulation or in addressing online aid. Because actually, the, the mix between the rule of law and the rule of platforms also should take into account the problem of the rule of tech. So the problem of AI moderating online aid speech. Because now we have platforms you know, moderating content using AI. Because we do not have a kind of public platform, you know, platform managed by state actors to moderate content. And maybe it's a good thing if you think about that. But still, you know, but if you think about that, also states, you know, could hold their platform to remove content, even if they do not have a public infrastructure, still, they still can play or interfere with the right to freedom of expression, but also with other fundamental rights. And this can be connected to other things, as has been mentioned, think about gender. You know, think about whether hate speech or against gender is something is tolerated in some countries and some others not. And so countries can decide to order social media to remove or not. And so what is actually the standard that applies? What is the role of the rule of law on a global scale? So 
So these are questions that are open. And I, since I promised that I will have to speak for less than 20 minutes because I want actually to hear your question, I would like just to thank you so much for your attention. I'm more than happy to hear all of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Giovanni, for the overview of issues uh, of moderation online and um, the future implications as well. Uh, and I see we already have the first question from Gad. Thanks very much, Giovanni. Um, well, it, it was a very uh, comprehensive paper, uh, but one comment, um, there are actually two comments. I think that one source of tension between national law and regulation on websites and communities would be a tension between a liberal nation state and non-liberal communities. Um, if you would like later on, I can send you, I've published about it, uh, uh, not, on, not in the context of uh, one paper on the, on the context of the ultra-Orthodox communities in Israel, and the other book is, is much more theoretical and not referring to online communities. But it seems to me that this is a place where you would like to look more in depth. Let's say uh, websites of the KKK. Should the state, in the US, should the state regulate it? So I think that this tension between national regulation or even regulation by um, um, corporations like Microsoft, uh, uh, Google, uh, and others, and non-liberal communities which can impose internal constraints on members, like based on gender, um, non-believers. So what are you doing about it? This is one challenge, and I think that uh, you may wish to, to look into it. My second question is about the First Amendment. Um, I think that the rulings around First Amendment, Amendment are more convoluted than it looks like. Um, take the issue of the, uh, uh, you know, the parade of Nazis in Skokie. Skokie is on the border between uh, Chicago and Evanston, quite nearby Northwestern University. So, are you preventing or are you allowing Nazis to walk in a need Jewish neighborhood, you know, in order to inflame some kind of uh, even violence? And, uh, and I already mentioned the KKK. At, at which point are you saying, whether online or offline, this is where we should in a way hold freedom of expression. So I think that the First Amendment in a way should be de demystified. Thanks, it's a wonderful paper. Uh, thank you very much for the two questions. Giovanni, would you like to answer them before we go to the next one? No, yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. So, uh, okay, thank you. These are really, you know, very useful comments. I will look, I mean, I will be really happy to read, you know, your contribution. I agree with you. I mean, this debate about communities, you know, and the way in which also communities define their roles and also in a way define their self-regulation, it's a very, in a way, it's a debate that was really, you know, at the beginning, you know, at the advent of the internet. If you read the paper, for example, in the 90s or the first, year, the first years of the new century, in a way, there was this idea of how we can regulate these communities and actually they have their rules like i don't know sports communities i don't know religious communities or whatever you know the point is uh, in a way uh, this is not just a question for the rule of law for states but it's also a question for platforms because it's not just a problem of the states that have to decide whether to respect or tolerate some form of extremism in a way or not but also for platforms because in a way platforms are even uh, they are doing even a uh, worse job than states if you think about it. because they always said yeah we are a global community we have standards for two billion of people no matter where you are we want to protect free speech this is a problem in a way you know because no one can really believe that you can ensure you know 
a global standard, whether we are so different, even when we move inside our own states, you know, not just, of course, if we need just to move or switch continents, you know. And so the question is about also whether and what social media could do, you know, in a way, I'm not just advocating to extend the rule of the platform in a way, but I'm just saying that uh, sometimes social media have not reflected too much about how to moderate differently different communities to reflect you know, diversity in social media. But this is happening because of the rule of platforms, because the idea of, uh, of platform as business actors, because it's a question of scale. Because if you have a uniform set of guidelines, no matter what, you know, for the entire world, it's much, much cheaper than, of course, implementing different AI systems of different teams to moderate content in different countries. So the first problem is about platforms, you know, because you can imagine a world where each social media has a kind of headquarter in each state, as it is also for content moderation. So the servers are in each state and you moderate content based on, not the rule of law, but based also on the, the idea of communities, at least in a certain state, you know? And so you can take into account uh, different issues or, you know, like the one you mentioned, for example, the different also illiberal communities that they are regulated in a way, or they are not regulated or taken you know, are considered with a liberal viewpoint, you know, so the problem is about, yes, but probably there are people that do not agree with that kind of regulation. And this leads us also in the way in which platforms also use contracts to say, yes, but I mean, these are the terms of the service, terms of the service, you have agree with that when you actually sign up to Facebook or whatever, whatever platforms, even to YouTube. So if you have accepted the guidelines, I, do, I don't care about what communities you, you, you belong to, you know, because actually you accept the rule of the game. So it's like when you go to a country, and it's quite interesting to think a bit about this idea of platform geography. So it's the problem is also when you go to a country, you cannot say, yes, but we are an, a community coming from the other side of the world. We have our own rules. No, because the law of that country will apply to you no matter what are your ideas. You know, so these are in a way problems that exist even in the real world. The problem is that platforms, you know, or even states have not encouraged or created incentives for, you know, these are not a good thing to say, to in a way zooming, you know, create some kind of areas, national areas to, to govern uh, the uh, content or the spread of online hate speech in a way. I mean, this is also a good thing because also think about a framework that is like, uh, smaller or national base could also announce the cooperation between states and platforms in this field. That is something that probably we, sometimes we cannot imagine is the best solution to deal with the spread of online hate speech, because especially in the US, this will lead you know, to a lot of problems in terms of the state cooperating with online platforms. So this has been also shown in the last 10 years in the field of surveillance, for example, but it's not just the US for sure. So this is my answer, at least in my opinion, for the first question. For the second question, totally, I agree with you. I think that in a way, uh, uh, the First Amendment, it's, uh, it's in a way, it's interpreted in a way, in a way that's too much rigid in a way. But I think that it would be definitely possible, not just, of course, um, regulating hate speech, but at least following what the EU is doing in terms of regulating the procedure according to which speech is, uh, you know, flow or is processed online. Because we, so there is a difference between saying uh, this is hate speech and saying uh, you should be transparent and tell me how you actually remove the hate speech. There are two different things. One is procedural, the other one is substantive. So I do not think, to be honest, at the very end that the First Amendment really would preempt any attempt to regulate the procedure, you know, through which platforms, of course, regulate content, not just content. So we do not want to say that platform cannot remove hate speech or not but still let us know what they are doing actually behind the screen. So this would be really helpful for living in a democratic society. So these are my answer to your question, but I'm more than happy, of course, to engage more with these questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you both. And we've got a question from Ido next. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, thank you, Giovanni, for a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, have a question because we're talking a lot about the problem with hate speech and the problem with setting the limitations on hate speech versus freedom of speech and within that uh, spectrum we need to talk about the, the the value of hate speech the the positive value of hate speech which might sound a bit uh problematic as you as we say it but um, if we allow extreme speech, if we allow uh, hate speech, we might be uh, diffusing 
uh, physical harmful activities. So um, speech has its own positive value on its own. And there's a question of how can we um, make sure that on the one hand, we prevent extreme uh, hate speech, which is harmful, but we don't um, limit the positive aspects of that. And this is especially relevant within the, the online platforms, the social media. And uh, I wrote that to, to Elena uh, in a side note, but um, there is, we want hate speech on social media. We actually want hate speech on social media because if it's not there, we can't regulate it. We can regulate its outcomes. We can relate, uh, uh, regulate, we can prevent the physical attacks if we don't see the speech, the hate speech that preceded that. So if we're gonna say no hate speech at all on Twitter, nothing on Facebook, we're gonna prevent everything that we uh, regulate as hate speech, um, especially within the Delta that uh, Gadi talked about earlier, between the criminal and the unethical uh, hate speech, then it's not going to go away. It's just going to move uh, to, uh, it's already in the dark net, of course, and uh, places that we can't regulate, but it will get expand on Chen4, Chen8, and other platforms that aren't as regulated as Facebook and Twitter, and they're not part of the discussion of how to regulate um, freedom of speech and hate speech on these platforms. So we want that kind of harmful uh, speech on social media because this is a, a key aspect if we want to regulate and prevent harmful aspects of that. So where, where do you think that gap should stand with, we want that, but we don't want that too much? Yeah, thanks. You know, this is really this is a really interesting question because, uh, I mean, if there is no hate speech online, you know, if everything is removed, at the same time, it's also difficult to study the problem of hate speech online, you know, and this also leads us to the problem of researchers studying hate speech online because, you know, there is this problem that also there are no enough data. Yes, there are some platforms like, uh, of course, Facebook that provides access to CrowdTangle to study the problem of hate speech, but still there are very few data you can extract from. So the data sets are not so big in order to conduct uh, the same or to have the same scale that social media have when they even train AI. So it's not the same thing, but still. So the question is about also, I agree with you. So we need some, in a way, hate speech, but not just because we need to study hate speech, but also because society needs hate speech. You know, We cannot imagine to live in a society without hate speech. It's like to, you know, to advocate for peace in the world. Yes, for sure it's relevant, but it's, it's a dream. You know, So we need to be, you know, aware that hate speech is a problem, like other problems in the world, you know, and needs to be managed, needs to be in a way regulated if you want, but needs in a way, it's a risk, you know, it's something that cannot be, you know, eradicated or eliminated per se, you know. So, of course, it also a democratic society wants actually to have people free to express their own ideas, even sometimes if, um, you know, I do not need to mention this, if we look at the case law, even the European Court of Human Rights or the, the US Supreme Court, I mean, it's really important that people have the possibility to say what they think, you know, even if sometimes it's quite rude, you know, in a way. And this is part of the democratic debate. And this is also why we do not have uh, laws on disinformation, for example. There is a lot of times when disinformation meets hate speech, if you think about it. But still, you know, um, so the problem is that, of course, we need some hate speech online. So, and, but also we need hate speech in society, because if I cannot actually... Um, I mean, I cannot say insult you or actually say something against you. It's really different that I can even express my identity or even feeling some emotion like rage or other, you know, so otherwise it's really difficult, you know, also to express your own identity. So it's very much connected to also the identity we can, we can, we can express in, our, in a democratic society. Or think about even criticizing politicians, you know, a lot of, you know, it's plenty of, you know, if we go online, but not just online, of no, hard critics even against whatever political there is still is protected as political speech you know and this is probably the most difficult part to regulate you know because the problem is that of course what is the dignity of a public figure probably there is no dignity if you're a public figure so it's quite interesting as a perspective so i agree with you so definitely we need the hate speech also to study that but also because we need to have some hate speech to tolerate the problem is that 
where to draw the line, I mean, this is really hard to say. Um, also because speech, you know, it's a matter of context, uh, case by case assessment. It's very difficult to draw the line. Usually our courts, you know, they draw the line in these things. So, and we need the, so the, the point is that the relevant point is to focus on courts as the actors that then, of course, shape the boundaries of what is accepted or not in a certain society. That this opens other questions about the role of courts, for example, in countries where courts are made of juries or a kind of judges are elected by people, rather in other countries where courts are parts of a broader, you know, it's a pieces of the public administration in a way. So uh, this opens other questions, but we, we have no time to deal with that. But still, you know, so I agree with you, but we need to understand who are the actors involved and can, in a way, enforce or protect these rules. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Very important point on, yes, how to differentiate between the hate speech that we can't have um, and the, uh, can't allow and the hate speech that we need, as you both said. Uh, and a question from Elena. Thank you for waiting patiently, by the way. No worry at all. It's very interesting uh, uh, discussion. And thank you, Giovanni, for the presentation and for the paper. That I'm really happy to hear that some of your answers really relate to my uh, paper and presentation, especially when it comes to some solutions that may be, uh, I mean, in relation to the, the definition, how we can um, we think of using more localized uh, approaches, as well as like the role of course, then I argue regional courts could be uh, a good um, ally to, to platforms in this sense. But I do have a, a couple of um, comments and, and questions for you uh, on your presentation. So, First of all, you talk about law, uh, law, lawlessness of content moderation, and I found it in your paper, not so much in your presentation, but I, I do think that one of the main elements that makes content moderation law, lawlessness is the lack of accountability. And you stress this in, in, in your, in your uh, paper, but I think you could even stress it more, how the lack of accountability and oversight is really what makes it so lawlessness. And even if we, we agree that there is a rule of platforms and a rule of tech, if all this could be more accountable and if there was an oversight uh, about all that, then maybe the, the uh, rule of law would prevail uh, more. And also a, a provocation is that um, when you say, yeah, because I mean, the rule of platforms prevail, the rule of tech prevails and the rule of law doesn't have then much space. Can we blame the law, maybe? And the fact that at a low level, we are not clear in uh, definitions. And I mean, it's well, my, my paper, Tegan's paper, also Eva paper, I think on the third day, we will deal on uh, the, the problem and struggle with definition. So is it also the fact that we are not clear uh, legally on, on, on the legal framework around this uh, um, phenomenon that makes the rule of law so uh, weak uh, and allows space for the platforms to, to uh, flourish and to take more space? Uh, so can we do something on, on that side and on, on the definition side on, on, on uh, setting the, the uh, stronger parameters for the law to, uh, to operate to, to regain its um, uh, role? Also, you mentioned the Facebook Oversight Board as a good um, uh, possible good, good uh, sign. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I agree with some of your arguments, but at, this, at the bottom line, I think that we need to remember that the Facebook Oversight Board was established by Facebook, now Meta, and in a way perpetrate this rule of the platforms, because yes, the legal basis of the Oversight Board is international human rights law, but is also the uh, Facebook um, uh, community guidelines and uh, terms and conditions. So the rule of the platforms is at the basis of the action of the oversight board. So in a way, it will only strengthen this rule of the platforms even more. So we may need something that is uh, more independent from, from the, these platforms and uh, really exercise this kind of oversight uh, where the rule of law is strengthened and, and not just like increase the, the rule of the platform. Um, and then you, you make lots of um, uh, reference to the, yeah, the US example as how the, the First Amendment, of course, uh, uh, changes completely the, the debate and the fact that all these um, platforms have their headquarters in the US and are influenced by the US uh, approach to freedom of expression is definitely uh, important. But here as a human rights lawyer, I can't say that we do have a solution and the solution is to uh, kind of like put aside a little bit the uh, national legal framework and embrace more international human rights law. International human rights law gives us this, this 
international framework uh, that uh, the US as well as the European uh, model should, should, should I mean, comply with. Uh, and so maybe uh, we should even more, uh, I mean, in light of all, the, all these differences and the fact that these companies are global, should we then maybe even more uh, um, support an international human rights law and a human rights based approach to content moderation? But thank you very much for that. Okay, can I have another slot to present something else? Because this probably needs another 30 minutes. So thank you so much, Helena. So this is really interesting. And I mean, I have answers to these questions. It's really rare, but this time I have answers, actually, probably. Okay, uh, the first point. Yeah, I totally agree with you, you know. And to be honest, uh, when even I used the, uh, the expression rule of law was actually to underline the lack of accountability and oversight. The question whether we can use something like the rule of law when we talk about the rule of platforms, because actually we cannot expect that a private actors has the same degree of accountability and oversight like the state, you know, because indeed it's a private actor, you know, so when we think, if you think of, it's paradoxical in a way, and this is why the provocation in the paper, it's behind the line, you know, or between the lines to think about the rule of platform is a call for accountability because it's a rule of platform is quite paradoxical because as a private actor, you know, private actors usually, if you think about even in corporate law scholarship, I'm not because I'm an expert, but if you think about how corporation are managed or govern, usually it's really authoritarian. It's not really democratic if you think about that, you know? And so this is, is something that it's really against any forms of uh, oversight, accountability, you know, because it's actually a matter of money and shareholders. So, and this is something that belongs also to platforms in a way, you know? So the rule of the platform, what are the characteristics of the rule of platform? For sure, it's not accountability and oversight, think <laughs> of that. So, but definitely this is a call to say how the rule of the platform could be more accountable and, or in a way, um, in a way we, we could say transparent. I mean, even if it's quite hard to advocate for transparency in this field. Um, but, uh, and this is very much connected to the second point, you know, uh, that is about, uh, the second point is the third, but still the Facebook oversight board. Because um, the way in which I look at the Facebook oversight board, I agree with you when you said that, yes, but uh, at the very end, they scrutinize the rule of platform. So at the very end, they are contributing to, or they are consolidating that, that approach, you know, that, 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 that kind of the rule, that kind of rules or laws, you know, or, or, or quasi law. Um, quasi legal framework, but still, uh, the point is that the Facebook Oversight Board, at the very least, try to increase oversight in the rule of the platform. If you think about that, of course, it's not a big, you know, step forward, but in a way, it's a way in which the rule of the platform is becoming more, in a way, it's becoming closer to the rule of law. You know, of course, with the world, there are a lot of problems in terms of independence, because of course, the board and the trustees. You know, sometimes the money always come from Facebook, so we know what are the problems in terms of independence. But we have a model, in a way, that try to institutionalize or, in a way, having some more oversight and accountability over the rule of the platform. So, in a way, this answer also to, to the first question about how we can increase our accountability and oversight. Probably the answer is outside the rule of law. It's in the field of constitutionalizing the rule of platforms. And this is much connected to my research on digital constitutionalism and data. And um, yeah, the law is not very good. Yeah, this is not a surprise to be honest. Yeah, definitely. You know, the problem of legal definition is usually the first problem. And when we deal with speech, this is really hard because even when we define a speech, you know, every time even courts, you know, uh, define the same problem in different ways or address the same problem in different ways because sometimes it's a speech, sometimes it's not. So it depends on the context. You know, and the problem of the context is so much connected also with the problem of AI that is not able to detect context in a way. You know, so it's not just the law that is not able to do a very good job, but it's also AI that is not very good to do a good job. So the problem is that between the rule of law and the rule of tech, the question is about what the rule of platform is doing to say what is hate speech. The fact is that they are not doing a lot in a way because they are relying on the law or the AI to say what is hate speech, you know? So, and since both the law and the AI are quite failing to say clearly, of course, what is hate speech, even the rule of platform are failing, is failing to do that, you know? This is just my opinion for sure. And, uh, but still, of course, it's a question about what is the role of law on a global scale, you know? And this connects to the, and uh, this also allows me to go to your 
uh, to the point about the human rights law framework, yeah, for sure, that would be relevant um, to think about human rights law in the field of content moderation. Also, the former Special Rapporteur of Freedom of Expression, the JS, underlined so much the role of the international human rights law in the field of content moderation and online platforms. The question, the, the answer, in my opinion, it's actually yes, definitely human rights law can play a very relevant role, but there are two points. First of all, is the enforcement, because uh, it's not always clear, always how, and of course we cannot imagine, a, a, probably, probably we can, probably we can imagine like a international court for, uh, for not for online platforms, but for you know moderating content. I mean, we can we can discuss that. I mean, you can organize a workshop to discuss that. Why not? So, but this is a, a, another point, and I think the other important point is also that the openness of some countries to international law. Because it's true that, uh, I mean, countries are, you know, have an obligation to respect those treaties. But when we look at, uh, you know, at the more closer, you know, or closer in a way, also at how you, uh, the U.S., for example, not just the U.S. for sure, but the U.S. is kind of a big example, interact with international law, or in a way it's open to international law, we have a lot of doubts in a way about really international human rights law can play a big role in the US, you know, and we have multiple examples like that, that it does not just concern, um, uh, I mean, online platforms or free speech, think about what is happening in a lot of problems with the US and how international human rights law sometimes do not really, does not really find a way to enter really the US legal framework, but there are also other problems in other states like that. So. Uh, I think one of the problems is how states are open to international law. It's not always clear, you know, and and you see that even in the system of enforcement. So these are, uh, you know, my answers. So thank you so much, Anna, because we, um, this has allowed me to, you know, dealing with different points of the paper, you know, thanks. Uh, thank you, Elena, for questions that covered so many interesting points, and Giovanni for the answers. What you said about the rule of platforms also made me think about social corporate responsibility a growing phenomenon where so many companies are taking a, a an official stand on political and social issues but um but usually it's still in line with their business interests so um yeah something to observe as well and we have a next question from martin yeah thank you thank you giovanni for um for the paper i liked uh, very much to read it because it's uh, written in a um, in a uh, style I like very much. When, when my students ask me how to develop an argument for their papers and thesis, I always recommend them to, to read decisions by constitutional courts or something, because this, this way how, how lawyers are developing their arguments, weighing arguments, come to conclusions, uh, uh, is always uh, something I appreciate and uh, can be a, a model for for uh, even academic uh, developing uh, development of arguments. So I, I like that very much. Um, uh, and the structure, it, it gave it to your paper. I just um, have two, just two things I would um, uh, add here. One is a question that could uh, come from the platform perspective, and that is, whether algorithms really constitute a third level of, of governance or whether algorithms are just an extension of the this platform logics because given the fact that these algorithms are i mean they're uh, opaque okay so we don't see how they work but if they are developed and programmed um, in a good way, they should basically follow the logics of Facebook or any other platform who, who employ them. And so the question is, are they just an extension of platform logics or are they are, are they constituting really uh, an own new level uh, of governance? So that would be interesting what your arguments would be to stress that. And the second remark is that I would um, love to see more assessment of these solutions you were just um, tipping on in your conclusions. So these uh, social media boards, for example, these oversight board or the EU's regulation approaches and see how these options of dealing with this governance problem are affecting your levels of, of governance. So which 
which approach is contributing to to which problem you outlined before but maybe that's also uh, that may be also a question for for the next <laughs> the next paper i don't know thanks martin first of all <laughs> thanks for saying that sometimes lawyers <laughs> await once where arguments you know i mean th thank you so much by the way um i mean uh, the, the first point you really you know understood sometimes i str i struggle very much with deciding you know when writing the paper uh with deciding whether the rule of tech is part of the rule of platforms to be honest you know because you actually uh this was one of my you know concern when i write when i wrote the paper and i thought a lot about that saying yes as you said at the very end the systems are programmed or are conceived within the framework of platforms you know so of course they answer in a way the rule of the, the rule of platforms but still um i try to decide to think about the rule of tech for two reasons one, because it's interesting because uh, also social media, uh, you know, usually says that they are not really able to predict what is happening, you know, or the, one of the big defense systems, but AI is not account is, I mean, it's a, it's a system we cannot actually, just two people in the world can really understand. So probably this means that there is something is not going really in the right direction. So the, actually, the point is that, uh, and this is why I decided to talk about the rule of tech. So they accept the risk you know, not to be able to explain or to understand what is happening because it's so profitable at the end, you know. So because this <clears throat> belongs to the economic logic, you know, behind these actors that, you know, no matter even what nuclear weapon you can use, you know, but still, if it is profitable, it's a good thing, you know, <laughs> to think about, you know. And this is where actually corporate social responsibility comes in, the role of states in order to mitigate when that, in a way, freedoms because these are private freedoms are economic freedoms turns into forms of i cannot say power but in a way uh, forms of abuse of freedoms that leads to problems for society so this is the role of the state you know if you think about even in europe the state is kind of it's not seen as in the us as, a, as an interference but it's also seen as something protecting also in a way uh, the citizens you know in a way the positive obligation of states the con this concept comes from the european convention of rights the idea of dignity so um and this is also why we have a different conception of hate speech also because of history of our you know the eastern side of the atlantic of the eu of the of, the, of europe so of course i thought about that it's a really relevant point uh, at the same time i decided that the, this is a kind of another layer this has also been shown during the pandemic when uh, uh, Facebook, for example, or other platforms, also Google, decide to leave content moderators on, so human moderators on because of the pandemic. What happened is also that they are, you know, take the lead of the, the entire lead of the process. And this has led to removal of fake accounts or to removal of other or spreading more disinformation or other problems with the online content. And platforms uh, cannot, could not really explain why that happened, you know, apart saying that we have not relied anymore on human moderators. And this is a big issue. You know, in a way. So this is why I think that also because the rule of tech is also problematic for the rule of law and for state actors using AI technologies. Because even state actors, even if they develop the system, they fail to understand that problem. You know, and so I think its uh, dimension is increasingly interesting. Probably will be clearer in the next years when AI will increase and become more, in a way, independent. In a way, you know, in a way, independent to develop their own system. So this is why the reason. And I agree that uh, I should stress more how the solution deal with solving the issues between the different layers of governance in the field of social media, because for sure, uh, the Facebook oversight board, as I was talking, of course, with all of you and also to answer Elena, deals more with the rule of platforms in a way, but also with the rule of tech. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if you think about it, also using human rights law in the Facebook oversight board, also in a way, bring us back to the question of the rule of law in a way. Broadly speaking, of course, if we can think about the rule of law in international law, it's even a huge topic. And this actually, I agree with you, and probably I would work a little bit more also on that part in the future to understand more how to uh, those uh, solutions could help to solve the problems of the lawlessness of collaboration. So thank you, Mark, for sure. Thanks. Uh, yes, thank you. And the next question is from Eva. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Giovanni. Um, it was really interesting um, to read your paper. Um, I think 
I, I would start, I, so I have just a couple of questions uh, like before. Um, regarding the, the title, so the lawlessness of, of, um, of the regulation, um, I'd be interested to understand uh, your your view on the United Nations guiding principles and because I don't see them referenced in your paper and of, of course it is a struggle of course they're not binding but in a way um, they are a legal instrument um, and I'd be I'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that uh, very much related to the context of your paper of course um, then also um, I, I I don't know if you if you were able to um, listen to my comment to the first session, but there's um, a piece by Alexander Brown of the Council of Europe um, that's uh, quite an extensive one on models of gov uh, um, governance of, on hate speech, online hate speech. And it's quite an extensive piece that um, lays out the nuances of the, the various models of, of governance. So from the oversight to moderation to curation to um, the various stakeholders. So I, I think it, it would perhaps be helpful to bring some of the new ones and now linking to a third comment um, on the oversight board. <laughs> because I, I even though I, I do see that you, you also lay some cons, um, at the end, you're, it's, 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 uh, it's important to remain hopeful, but I think it's also, um, there's, there's also a couple of points. If this is one of the main points of your article, because it has a section on its own, I think it could benefit from having even more nuanced on what are um, really the pitfalls so far. You know, for example, it really does not apply international human rights law. It applies Facebook uh, guidelines, uh, guideline community. So that one is, is a starting point in, in the whole discussion, um, for me at least. Um, and then they also wouldn't um, wouldn't hear cases that could render Facebook senior managers liable to criminal um, offenses. So there's so many nuances that I think could could um, yeah add on to the to to your work in that sense. Um, and and then that links to the the next comment I had on the DSA. So um, it, as far as I understood, the DSA is pointing to um, oversight. Of by public authorities. Uh, they've even mentioned a new European Board of, for Digital Services. So perhaps that could also be an interesting discussion to have in your paper to understand how, because that's really a difference. It's not, a, it's not an oversight board that's, that's uh, dependent uh, on, on the company itself. So perhaps that will be a bit of a game changer if, if it comes to life. Um, let's see, but it, because it really relates to the oversight, I think that would be an interesting uh, debate to have, um, or to, yeah, to to see what are what your thoughts are on that. Um, yeah, and um, again about the different models. So I think you chose to focus on the oversight, but perhaps that could also be um, clarified because, of course, there's different other models, right? Um, internal appeal process. So the oversight in itself has different nuances. And it could be public consultation with trusted flaggers. It could be internal appeal process. It could be fully independent supervisory committee. So there's so many variants, I guess, for what uh, the oversight uh, could be and how it could work. So I guess um, maybe expanding a bit on those variants. And that's, uh, you, you'll find inspiration as well from the, the reference that I just said the, the, from Alexander Brown. Um, and then I guess the final question, uh, and this is more of a, of a question rather than a comment, I, well, both, but um, so you've mentioned social media councils, I think more towards the end, but um, you've presented it as I understood a bit of a potential solution that could be explored. Um, it seemed really interesting to me and also linking it to uh, what you've mentioned as digital constitutionalism. And that made me think about the work of Gillian York um, and the way that she really advocates for users' rights and the sort of digital constitutionalism. And I'd be interested to understand how you would operationalize that. So how would you bring more power to the users? Because one of the things that she mentions is um, yeah, bottom-up approaches, opening up board seats and creating advisory boards with users even, uh, if it is the fact that if it is that that we're speaking about digital constitutionalism so how would that shape um yeah um yeah online platforms in our future um 
and and just one more thing um we've been discussing during the 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 the, the q a or the debate um throughout the whole day of course and i think many of us um agree with that i certainly do that there are three different categories of speech criminal prohibited and then not affected legally but i think it's also important even though we've mostly been talking about the legal uh, side of things to and because this is an interdisciplinary um, workshop to also speak about education and how education would be important to tackle the third not legally impacted category of speech um, so yeah that would be it for me thank you Okay, so wow, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, so um, I will try to follow the order. Okay, uh, the UN guiding principles. Um, I mean, yeah, it's definitely relevant. Um, sometimes, you know, like, uh, you know, sorry to mention another example, but like the debate about the ethics of AI, uh, sometimes I'm wondering uh, um, whether having these UN guiding principles, and, and I mean, when we focus on state actors, that's one, that's one point. This is the focus it was on social media. I mean, uh, I wanted to stress that these actors are really private actors, you know, and no matter whether at the end we try to put them, you know, use bottom up pressures like say, yes, yeah, let's stop uh, social media profiting from hate or whatever. I mean, have you seen anything changing, you know, to be, uh, to be honest, you know, sorry for this, but it's kind of a provocation, you know, also what is happening in Ethiopia, you know, now with social media. I mean, we have, um, I mean, we cannot say this has never happened. You know, the case of uh, Myanmar has already underlined the problem, not because social media leads to genocide. This is not the point, but still, you know, it's a piece of the debate, you know, it's a piece of the, bus of the puzzle, but still nothing has really changed with that, you know. Um, and now we are seeing more investments, real investments on a better systems so of AI in some areas of the world to detect hate speech. So yeah, we have this guiding principle and I don't really agree with you, but the problem is that sometimes platforms, they do not really see how they can profit using this guiding principles. I mean, so far, probably in the future, they will find a way. Um, thanks also for the suggestion of Brown and the models of the line hate speech. I'm pretty sure that the I remember that I have a look at that, but I will look more at that, you know, for sure, because you actually suggest that. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree that the Facebook oversight board, you know, I could stress more the, 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 the pitfalls or the problem, the drawbacks around this issue, this model. The only point that I'm really optimistic, to be honest, around Facebook oversight board, it's, that is probably a good example and will push a little bit state you know, and encourage states to think about the models, you know, or oversight or whatever to deal with the line eight speech. Because in a way, the Facebook oversight board, no matter what are the pitfalls, it's a good experiment. It's a good exercise in a way to think about the governance of online speech, you know, in, and so this also could uh, be, you know, also a trigger for states to do something, you know, or to rethink the role of states in, uh, the, in, in the framework of oversight or adjudication, you know? And so this is very much connected to what you said about uh, the question of the DSA, you know, about having this uh, public authority oversight. And also in a way, the Facebook Oversight Board is a good, you know, it's a sample, it could be like a sandbox, you know, to study what's happened when uh, you apply, you take, you choose, you know, a bunch of people around the world to say, yeah, now let's decide what, the, what, what actually is the pressure of free speech here. So it's an experiment and this could be helpful also for other social media, since we mentioned social media council or even a state actors to promote a system of oversight and online content moderation. So I see in a way in the Facebook oversight board, it's a good, you know, um, uh, it's a, in a way it's a good exercise, it's a good alarm for states or whatever to do something, you know? This is why I'm kind of optimistic on that. And let's see what will happen. And I agree that, of course, the DSA is pointing, you know, it's going towards that direction to say, yeah, we need public oversight. We waited for 20 years, we delegated the platform to do whatever they want. Now we want to go back, step back and regain our authority. Yeah, true. We will say how it works because no one knows how it works, especially for the problems of enforcement and different routes at national level, but national member states, uh, member states level, but fortunately, the DSA is a regulation. The system will, will uh, you know, in a way, um, apply at the, you know, at the supranational level. So I think that the nuances of the member states level will be very, very, you know, narrowed.
at the same time, the problem is that the member states have different also ideas around hate speech, if you think about that. Think about the Italy or Germany or France, or Eastern Europe or Scandinavian countries, you know? We have different ideas of what is hate speech or about what is hate speech. Um, but also, I think it's relevant also to look at the framework of the European Convention on Human Rights as a common European framework that has tried to find a way to define what is hate speech in a way. Um, yeah, of course, there are other solutions rather than oversight. Uh, I use just the example of the Facebook oversight to under, uh, the oversight board to underline a model that is actually existing. Because if you think about, yes, we can think about uh, theoretically, you know, a lot of systems that could be applied in framework of social media, but it's different when you say, yes, that would be the ideal world, but it's not the case, you know. So we can propose something and going normative. But it was just to study uh, something that actually is, ex is existing, you know, it exists already. You know, this is why I decided just to focus on, on that. And of course, bottom-up approaches are quite relevant also for social media council. I have not an answer on that because it's not easy to say what is the best approach when uh, you look at social media councils that involve users. We need to think more about that because also it depends on the platform. There are platforms where users are more active. Uh, like, I don't know, YouTube, for example, have a lot of active users, but like Twitch has more active users rather than other platforms that are a little bit like more like, like top down, like Facebook, for example, or other. So it depends also on the, the on each platform, but definitely the, the question about social media accounts is still open, you know, and uh, and I'm a little bit surprised that only Facebook has taken clearly this path or other social media decided to do something different. You know, I was expecting... Uh, in the short run, more competition in this model. If we, but but still, we'll see in the next future what will happen. Also, because now everyone is waiting also to see the effects of the DSA. So and so now, uh, the attention is actually focused, actually on the, the European Union and what it's doing. And I'm, I agree with you that also, uh, I mean. Uh, Mm, not just media literacy, but AI literacy or in a way, content moderation literacy or literacy, generally speaking, is relevant. Uh, and yeah, it's definitely relevant. Yeah, but the problem is that sometimes uh, this uh, general problem about digital skills and digital literacy is not just about the problem of line aid speech. Um, and to be honest, this does not just concern uh, users, but also the way in which state actors sometimes understand the problems. I think about, and I do not want to say nothing, I mean, anything, but also sometimes people in the public administration of some states do not always are bind by the rule of law and have not so much margins to address new issues without changing at the top level. So it's also a problem of uh, public administrative law, you know, of administrative law. So. Um, because at the very end, the things made by the state, also policy, are not just thought by parliaments, but then are enforced by, you know, ministries or whatever. So it's also important to see whether also people inside those areas are very well educated, because sometimes big tech giants can attract the best, you know, whatever, you know, professionals or whatever workers, skilled workers, whatever, but still the public administration is on the other side, because I have to deal with that so many public task like health education so so the question is about do we have a ministry for you know digital i mean some states like italy now is, has actually built this framework but it's not the case for a lot of countries so it's also about thinking about the literacy in the public administration in states how states also in judges the same thing you know so we need to think about more how institutions need more literacy not just users probably Sorry for that, but it's just to say, I think it's really relevant, uh, but probably just my opinion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, great comments again. Um, can I just check, Zinia, did you have a question or comment earlier? No, okay, thank you. Well, since we're running out of time um, and since it's the last uh, presentation for today, um, thank you very much, Giovanni, and thank you very much, everyone, for the discussion on this presentation on all of, the, all of them um, today. And maybe I'll just quickly pass it back on to Ido uh, before we say goodbye. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, indeed, it was very, very interesting uh, talk and discussion and, and thought-provoking at some points. And I think it was a very, very good start for our workshop, for the three days workshop. It was a brilliant first day of that workshop. Uh, I do want to uh, thank Elena, Tegan, and Giovanni for their presentation, and uh, Gadi and Carolina for moderating their panels. 
And tomorrow we're gonna kind of continue that workshop with a very uh, interesting day just as well. We're gonna have a keynote by Professor Gabriel Weimann on the virus of hate. And we're gonna have presentations by Laura uh, about online platforms and from Ursula about social media and hate speech. And it's gonna be just, an just as interesting and just as uh, interactive. And I look forward to see you all tomorrow. So have a nice day and enjoy.